All right, we are live. Welcome everyone. For those of you that are watching us on Facebook, glad you are here with us live from the Oasis. I'm Mike Davis. I'm the pastor of the Oasis along with my wife, Karen. And so we're glad that you're here with us for our live session that we do on live Saturday mornings. As of yet, our group is not yet meeting live together. Hopefully very soon in the future, we will be doing that. But we are meeting online and we come on Saturday mornings to share with you the word of God. We fellowship with one another in our Zoom room, and then we come on live and we share the word of God with you. So thank you for being here with us. We're going to pray and then we're going to get into our study of God's word. Father, we thank you for your word, for your spirit of truth who leads us and guides us into all of your truth. As David said, Lord, we pray this morning that you will open our eyes to behold wondrous things from your Torah, from your guidance, your teaching, your instructions. Show us your ways, teach us your paths, Lead and guide us into your truth and teach us because you are the God of our salvation. We look to you. We wait upon you all the day. And so we thank you, Lord God, for teaching us by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So if you've got your Bible, I'd like you to open to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. We are winding down our study on uh, success and prosperity, a kingdom perspective. So what we are doing is kind of recapping the things that we've covered over the past year and a half, talking about success and prosperity. And if you go to Joshua chapter one, verse eight, what we're doing here is um, looking at a particular topic as we recap everything that we've talked about. Joshua chapter one, verse eight, God said to Joshua, this book of the Torah shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night so that you may observe to do it according, so that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Now, we said last week that success and prosperity or flourishing is really God's idea. It's, it's his design for his creation. God has made us so that we will flourish in life. He's made all of his creation to flourish, and he's placed man as the catalyst to make that happen. Uh, in one sense, we are the pinnacle of God's creation. We are created in his image and his likeness. We were given the mandate, mankind, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and through 28, to really, uh, I call it the Genesis 1 mandate, we were given the charge to have dominion over the earth, to watch over the earth, and really to cause the earth to flourish. But this is God's idea. He wants us to, he wants us to flourish. He wants us to cause creation to flourish. So we are to pursue flourishing which I am using as a synonym for success and prosperity. As we saw last week, there are two types of success. There are two types of prosperity. There are two types of flourishing. And there is what I am calling good success, which I'm borrowing from Joshua chapter one in our English Bibles. I'm aware of the fact that it's our English Bibles and in, our, in the King James, the New King James and some other translations, they've translated the verse where, where it says, uh, you shall meditate upon the word day and night, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Now, we're going to be talking about a little bit later uh, what that, or in another message, what the term good success actually means in Hebrew, but I've been using this term, I've been basing off of that term, that there are two types of success when we look in the scriptures that we can experience. There is good success, and there is a bad success. So there is a good flourishing, there is a good prosperity, there's a bad success. There's a bad flourishing. There's a bad uh, prosperity. And so what we said based upon last week, which was our first message on this, as we begin to recap, that what we need to do is differentiate between the two. We need to really make sure that we're pursuing the right one. And so we've been exploring, exploring the differences. What is good success? And how do we know when we are pursuing good success? And what is bad success? And how do we know when we are pursuing bad success? It's important for us to know this, because as I said, I believe, according to scripture, that it is God's will for us to pursue good success. It's God's will for us to pursue a flourishing, but, the, but that flourishing that he calls us to pursue pleases him. So I've called this message, good success versus bad success, pursuing the flourishing that pleases God. Now, in saying that, again, there is a flourishing that doesn't please God. There is, a, there is a success and a pursuit of success that doesn't please God. So we are exploring the differences between good success and bad success. And we're looking at it, as I said last week, in three dimensions, spiritual, mentally, mental and emotional or psychological, 
and behavioral. Now, as I said last week, all of these overlap. They are interconnected. We are separating them for clarification. It's separation for clarification. But as we have begun to see last week, all of these, the spiritual, the psychological, the behavioral, they really all enter, uh, they all overlap, they are interconnected, they are integrated. So it's not, you really can't separate out one from the, from the other, they all impact the other. Now, last week we covered the spiritual dimension of good success and bad success. Today, we're gonna look at the mental and emotional or the psychological dimension of good success and bad success. You could call this the psychology of good success and bad success. Now, as we're going to see, um, the flourishing that pleases God or good success is motive. Well, let me. Well, it's motivated by good, positive, and resourceful emotions and ways of thinking. Good success, as we're going to see. And by the way, just to let you know, as I was putting this together yesterday, and, and I've, I've got notes and stuff, but I was putting it in its final form. I realized, oh, this psychological is going to at least take at least two messages. So today is is while we're on part two of good success versus bad success, the psychological part, it's part one, there'll be a part two next week, all right? Good success is motivated by good, positive, and resourceful emotions and ways of thinking. Bad success, the flourishing that doesn't please God, is motivated by negative, lower states of emotions and ways of thinking. What we want to do is cultivate on purpose those emotions that make for good success. We want to abstain from those emotions that make for bad success. Now, one of the things I want to do that I really didn't quite do last week is giving you a succinct uh, definition of good success and bad success. Now, in one sense, everything that we're talking about is more of an expanded definition of good success and bad success. But here is my uh, succinct in, in, encapsulated definition of good success and bad success. And I define good success based upon everything we studied this far, thus far as this. Good success is creating internal and external environments or conditions that become the catalyst for people and things for creation to flourish. When you are pursuing good success, when you are operating in good success, you are creating internal and external environments or conditions that become the catalyst for people and things, that becomes the catalyst for creation to flourish to become more fruitful, to realize and experience more of their creative design and potential, okay? So that's good success. You're creating internal and external environments. I'm gonna explain that in a moment. You're creating conditions, internal and external conditions that becomes the catalyst for people and things to flourish. Bad success is creating internal and external environments or conditions that bring about the suppression and the oppression of people and things. It brings about the suppression and oppression of creation. And it's, it prevents people, it prevents other things from flourishing and realizing their created potential. So bad success is about creating internal and external conditions that will prevent people, that will prevent things from flourishing and realizing their created potential because you're creating environments that bring about suppression and the oppression of people and their potential, all right? That is bad success. See, good, with good success, I've made a note for this, with good success, you are blessed and you become a blessing to others because of how you live. With good success, you are blessed and you become a blessing to others because of how you live. With bad success, you curse yourself and you become a curse to others because of how you live, all right? So that's my definition. Now I said it's about creating internal and external environments because what we will see, especially today and next week, as we talk about the psychology of good success and bad success, what we'll see is this. It's not just about what we do externally because what we do externally comes from the inside. When, when people are able to flourish, when creation is able to flourish, and we've studied this, in detail, so I'm recapping, but when people are able to flourish, when creation around us, when businesses are able to flourish, it is because creations are, cre uh, excuse me, it is because conditions or environments are created that enable people and things to flourish. But those conditions that we create 
externally start within. It starts on the inside of us. So if we, let's put it like this, as I said in the past, in order for there to be flourishing, there must be freedom. But if, so in order for us to create environments of freedom for people and things to flourish, we have to be free. We have to have an internal environment of freedom to flourish. And by the way, this applies to any area of life. It applies to your spiritual, your mental and emotional, your physical, your financial and relationships. It, it applies to your personal and your professional. It applies to your spiritual. It applies to church. It applies to outside of the church. Whenever there are conditions, if we are free within, we will create freedom without. But if we are bound within, if we are oppressed within, if we are suppressed within, we will recreate that in our environments, which will cause the oppression, it'll cause the suppression of things and people that we come into contact with and that we influence. So that's why I say good success and bad success both are based upon conditions that we create internally and external. The external conditions are created by our, our internal conditions. It's so like when I work with people in marriage, I know I use that a lot, but because I do a lot of work with people in marriages and I always tell them your marriage, the state of your marriage, whatever you are currently experiencing is created by you. Whatever you are currently experiencing in your marriage is because of what's on the inside of you and your spouse. And you and your spouse together bring forth whatever is in your marriage. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, above all that you guard, guard your heart. Why? Because out of your heart comes the issues of life. Out of your heart, what we experience in our external world to a great degree, I mean, there are some things that don't apply, but to a great degree, our environment, our conditions are created by us. They're created by people, okay? And even if people go, well, there's structures in place, and that's still created by people. That's what my point is that when we are suppressed, when we are oppressed within, we will bring that forth without, okay? And if we are free within, we will bring that freedom and create environments. We will create conditions of freedom without that will allow people to flourish, okay? All right, so uh, one of the things that we are going to be looking at is how is the internal conditions that we create, because the internal conditions don't stay internal. Our internal conditions or environments become external. They become embodied in our words, in our actions, in our behaviors. They, come, they become embodied in the way that we set up our environments themselves, okay? All right, so uh, we want, again, we want, we, in looking at good success and bad success, we want to make sure we're, in, in, in terms of the psychology of it, we want to make sure that we're cultivating a purpose, the, the emotions that make for good success, the ways of thinking that make for good success, while abstaining from the ways of things, thinking and emotions that make for bad success. So let's talk about the psychology of good and bad success. So here's the first one. Here's the first one that we're going to be looking at today. Actually, two of them together, they, they overlap with each other. And that's this. Good success is motivated by gratitude and is content. Good success is motivated by gratitude and good success flows from a place of contentment while bad success is ungrateful and is motivated by covetousness and is not content. Good success is motivated by gratitude and comes from a place of contentedness. Bad success is ungrateful and is motivated by covetousness and it is not content. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30, and we're going to look at verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15. God says to the people of Israel, see, I've set before you today life and death. Excuse me. I set before you today life and good, death and evil, and that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. Now, notice here that God says to the people of Israel that by walking in obedience to his commandments, he set before them life and good, death and evil, because he commanded them to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his judgments. And he said, if you do this, you will live and multiply. You will flourish. You will experience success and prosperity if you walk in my ways, if you walk and keep my commandments. So the commandments of God to Israel was the key, was the key to Israel experiencing good success. It was the key to Israel experiencing, experiencing flourishing 
that pleases God, that came from God. So obedience to God was expressed, excuse me, obedience to God was an expression and it was an embodiment of Israel's faithfulness or loyalty to God. So when Israel is keeping God's commandment, they, th this is how Israel shows their loyalty to God. This is how Israel shows their faithfulness to God. It is by keeping his commandment. As a matter of fact, the verse of scripture that many of us are familiar with, Habakkuk uh, chapter two, when he says, the just shall live by faith, Paul in the New Testament has made that famous. Uh, but in the first century world, this verse was also known. It could also be translated as the just shall live by his faithfulness. Within, by the first century, this was meant to, to, this was interpreted to mean by faithfulness, it was faithfulness to God's Torah, faithfulness to God's commandments in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. There's a verse there that, uh, there's a, a, a text in the Dead Sea Scrolls that speaks of this, and it interprets the just shall live by his faithfulness as referring to keeping God's Torah, being obedient to God's Torah. This is how the Jews, this is how Jews understands faith or faithfulness to God. To have faith in God or to be faithful to God, emunah means to be faithful. It is to be obedient to God's will, to be obedient to God's ways. So obedience to God, obedience to his commandments is how Israel embodies and expresses their loyalty and their faithfulness to God. Here's the question. What was the motivation behind Israel's faithfulness to God? What is it that would motivate Israel to be loyal and faithful to God and thus keep his commandments? The answer is the grace of God. The grace of God was the key to Israel's faithfulness to God, which was expressed in keeping his commandments. What do I mean by that? Well, in the Bible, the word grace is a relational term. I don't have it here because I think I put it up back up on my shelf. But one of the books that can really give you great insight into this is the book Honor, Patronage, Kinship, and Purity by Dr. David DeSilva, whom you've heard me uh, quote many times and quote from the book. And he really gave me a lot of great insight about what is grace from a biblical perspective? What is grace in a first century Jewish and Greco-Roman perspective? Since then, I've read other works, but his was the one that really helped me to, to see what grace was about. Grace is a relational term. Grace speaks of a, you know, we think of grace as a theological, spiritual term, but really grace in the Bible, in the first century, as well as in ancient Israel, it speaks of a relationship between two or more parties. It refers to the, grace refers to the giving of favors of showing kindness or favor to another person. Now, usually, not always, but often, usually, it speaks of a favor being shown, a favor being shown or kindness being shown by a person who is in a position of superiority to a person who is in a position of inferiority. In other words, you have a, you have a person in the, who's in a superior position giving and showing grace and favor to someone who is in an inferior position someone who has more, someone who has status, someone who has connection, someone who has resource, resources showing favor and kindness to someone who does not. They're in the inferior position. This could be a rich person. This could be a king showing favor to a, another king who doesn't have as much power and might. But usually it's the inferior, excuse me, the superior being given to an inferior, someone in a superior position showing kindness and favor to someone in an inferior position. Are you with me? Okay, so we can see examples of this within scripture. Turn to Genesis chapter 21. So we got to do a little bit of contextual background for you to understand that the basis of Israel's obedience to God, the motivation behind it was God's grace, all right? In Genesis chapter 21, I just want to show you an example of what I'm talking about, how grace is a relationship and it is a reciprocal relationship, and it is one in which someone who's in a superior position shows favor and kindness, grace, to someone who is in an inferior position. So we're going to look at Genesis chapter 21, and we're going to look at verse 22. Now, this is when Abraham is in conversation with uh, a king, Abimelech. Now, Abimelech is a king. Abraham is not. So Abimelech, from a cultural perspective, is in the superior position. Abraham, because he's not a king, is in the inferior position. In chapter 21 of verse 22, it says, and it came to pass at the time that Abimelech, the king, and Phicol, the commander of his army, spoke to, Abram, spoke to Abraham saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me by God that you will not, steal, that you will not deal falsely with me, 
with my offspring or with my, poster my posterity, but that according to the kindness that I've, that I've done to you, you will do to me and to the land and to the land in which you have dwelt. Now notice here, the king says, I want you not to deal falsely with me. Swear to me by your God that you will not deal falsely with me, nor with my offspring or with my, poster my posterity, but that according to the kindness that I've done to you, you will do to me. The word kindness here is the word for grace. He's saying here, I want you, it's the Hebrew word for grace. I want you to show me the same kindness, the same favor, the same grace that I've shown you. Notice the reciprocity. I've shown you kindness. I've shown you grace. I've shown you favor. Now I want you to swear to me that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants, but that you will also show favor, grace, and kindness back towards me. So the grace I shown you, you will show me. Okay, so here we see an example right here um, of how grace is reciprocal, and it is a superior who is shown one to another. And what King Abimelech is expecting is, Abraham, I've shown you grace, so I want you to return to me and show me grace. All right, let me give you one more example of this. Turn to Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. So notice the reciprocal relationship. The person who is in the superior position has shown grace, and yet he's expecting for the one who's in the inferior position to show him grace, to return the grace. And you say, well, how is that possible? We'll explain that in just a moment. But what I want to establish first is that you have an, a person in a superior position giving to one who's in an inferior position. It's a relationship, but the one in the inferior position is also expected to return the grace to the one who has shown him grace. All right, Joshua chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 12. Joshua chapter 2 and verse 12. And again, this is another example. Look at verse 12 here, and it says, uh, this is Joshua speaking, and uh, not Joshua, this is actually um, Rahab. This is when the spies have come into Jericho. Rahab has hidden the spies, and this is the conversation that they're having. Now, verse 12, Rahab is speaking. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness. And the word here, again, is the, is the Hebrew word chesed, which is can be translated as loving kindness or grace. Show you, I have shown you chesed, I've shown you kindness, I've shown you favor, I've shown you grace. So swear to me by the Lord your God that since I've shown you kindness, you will also show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that, on all that they have and deliver our lives from death. So the men answered her, our lives for yours if none of you tell this business of ours, and it shall be when the Lord has given us the land, that we will deal kindly and truly with you. So what happened? Well, who's in a superior position? Technically speaking, Rahab was, because they were hidden in Rahab's house. They were, being, they were kept safe. She could have ratted them out, and they would have been killed. But instead, she protected them. And she said, now, I've shown you kindness by protecting you. I, who was in the superior position by virtue of the fact that you owe your lives to me. I could have ratted you out and I didn't do it. But now what, I, what I'm asking for you to do is as, as I have shown kindness to you, basically it's like as I have protected your life, I want you to show kindness because Rahab said, listen, we heard about what the Lord did to Egypt. We heard about what, how powerful your God is. We know that we can do nothing against your God. Our hearts melted when we heard about what God did to Egypt. We know we have no defense against you. So she said, look, we know you're going you're gonna to come and you're going to conquer. I'm asking that when you do so, you show grace to my family because I've shown grace to you. Show grace to my family. Return that grace. Return that favor. Return that kindness and keep my family and all that they have alive. Keep and preserve it. Watch over, protect it. And the men said, if you don't write us out, if you don't tell anyone about us, we will do for you as you have done for us. We're going to return that grace to you. So again, notice that the one who receives an act of grace, favor, or kindness must respond with an act of grace, favor, or kindness. It is grace for grace. It's a relationship of reciprocity. 
I have shown you grace. And so there is an unspoken obligation to return that grace back to you. Now, I know that may seem strange to us because we say, oh, well, no, Mike, grace is freely given. Yes, grace is freely given, but it was understood in the ancient world. It was understood in the first century Jewish world. It was understood in the first century Greco-Roman world that it show, if someone shows you grace, which is freely given by the one who shows you grace, Rahab did not have to do this for them. Abimelech did not have to be kind to Abraham. It was an act of free will. It was an initiation, but it was understood if someone shows you grace, there is an obligation to return that grace. This is something that a lot of times in Christianity, we don't get, we go, well, grace is freely given. So therefore we believe there is no obligation to grace. That is completely wrong. And the Bible doesn't teach that. There is an obligation to return grace for grace. If you've been shown grace, you are to return that grace. Now, you may not be able to return in the exact same way, but there is to be an act of grace that is shown. This is what, it was, this is what was understood in the biblical world. Is everybody with me? Okay, so if you, re, if you have been shown grace and you return that grace or favor, this was seen as an act of gratitude because of the grace that you were shown. So in other words, if, if you and I met together, and let's say you needed something in order to get a business started. Let's say you needed money, you needed a loan, and you didn't have what it took in order to start your business. You didn't have the capital. You didn't even have the building. And I said, you know what? Tell you what, I've got the money. I've got even a building. We're going to give you some startup capital, and we're going to provide you with a, a building. And I'm not going to charge you. I'm going to give it to you freely. That would be considered an act of grace. Now, what is expected is that that, that that would elicit within you gratitude. And so as because of your gratitude, you would show me an act of grace in return. This is how it was understood. This is how it was practiced within the first century Jewish and Greco-Roman world of Jesus and Paul and the writers of the New Testament. This is how grace. So grace wasn't just a religious or spiritual term. Grace was a secular term. It actually was a secular term that was brought over by Paul, but really, again, we think of it as spiritual, but this is just how they were functioning and operating. We think of it as theological, but this was a part of life, okay? And so if you return grace, it is seen as an act of gratitude. Why? Because my gift to you causes you to feel like, wow, Mike, thank you so much. So what can I do for you? And there were different things that you can do. One of the things that you could do for a person who showed you grace, who gave you a gift, who showed you favor, who opened up doors for you, wherever it was, is that you would give them praise. You would praise them. You might dedicate a portion of your building. You might have their name inscribed. You might sing their praises to other people. So praise and th praise was a way of showing your gratitude to another person. Makes sense now, one of the reasons why we praise God, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. We give God praise because of the grace that he's shown us, all right? Again, this was the world uh, of the Bible. This is the world of the ancient Near East and as well as the first century Mediterranean world. This is how people lived. What was another way that you could show grace? What was another way you could express your gratitude? Go to Deuteronomy chapter five, Deuteronomy chapter five, and we're going to look at verse one, Deuteronomy chapter five and verse one. Look at another way. One of the ways you could do it was by singing someone's praises. Um, and there's different ways you could do that. You could express gratitude to them by declaring how great they are, how wonderful they are. That was one way of showing gratitude, praise. Another way, Deuteronomy chapter five, we'll, we'll see here, Deuteronomy chapter five, we're going to read verses one through seven. It says, and Moses called all Israel and said to them, hear, O Israel, the, the statutes and the judgments, which I speak in your hearing today, that, uh, let me back up. Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments, which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. Now he's talking about God's commandments in the Torah. He's talking about the requirements of the covenant that they have with God. Verse two, the Lord your God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord did not make the covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today and all of us who are alive, the Lord talked with you face to face on the mountain from the midst of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord 
for you were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up the mountain. He said, the Lord, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Okay, so what is Moses doing here? Moses is recounting the covenant that God made with Israel in Horeb at Mount Sinai. Now, whenever you made a covenant, it was customary to recite what the superior person, the person in the superior position, what they did for the inferior person or the person in the inferior position. So when you would make a covenant, you would recite what the superior person did for the inferior person. Why? You recount the gracious deeds or acts of grace that were done for the inferior purpose. The reason for doing this was that by reciting the gracious deeds and acts of the superior person, it would, it would elicit a response of gratitude from the person in the inferior position. So you would talk about all the wonderful things that this person did for us as you began to make the covenant. This is the way covenants were done. It's one of the ways covenants were done. We have, we have examples of this where they will start to talk about that if a king, a superior king, a great king made a covenant with a lower king, we would call a suzerain, a suzerain and a vassal. When we talked about those terms before, you have this great king, powerful king. Then you have this less powerful, or we could call inferior king. He doesn't have a lot of might, doesn't have a lot of power. So he makes a covenant with this great king. And the great king will do things for him. He will save him. He will come to his aid. He will provide him military might. He might provide him with provisions. So when they make the covenant agreement, one of the first things you did was recite all of the great things that the great king or the great person did. The purpose of this, again, is to elicit a response of gratitude for the person in the inferior position. I keep saying it because I want to make sure you're clear about what I'm saying. Now, how did the inferior person show or express their gratitude? It was by showing faithfulness or loyalty to the superior person who granted them the favor or the grace in the first place. So the person who did great things, we will recount all of their gracious deeds. We will recount all of their great acts. We will recount all of the provision, all of the benefits that they provided for us out of their graciousness, out of their grace. We would talk about all the grace that they showed us. Once they did that, the idea was it would elicit within us gratitude. And one of the ways we would express to them, and we said one of the ways to express gratitude was to sing their praises. Another way to express gratitude was by showing them loyalty, by showing them faithfulness, by being faithful or loyalty to the person who showed us grace. And this is what we see God calling Israel to do, because again, what is Moses doing here? He's recounting the covenant. What is the first thing you do in recounting the covenant? You talk about all the great things that a person did. What do we see in verse six? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now you may say, and as I thought, man, this is short, but when Israel heard this, they would think about all of the things that God did, because God didn't just simply bring them out of the house of bondage. It, it was more to that. We know that God did miracles. God made provision. God led them through the wilderness. He took care of them. This was to remind them of all of the great things that God, their king, the one in the superior position, what he had done for them in delivering them out of Egypt. Now, let me say this right here, because we tend to think sometimes within Christianity, and I hope if you've been following me long enough, you have, been, you have removed this idea from your mind, that the law has nothing to do with grace, that the law was about law, the Old Testament is about law, and the New Testament is about grace. This is a false way of thinking about the, the first covenant and the second covenant. The first covenant is filled with grace. Why did God deliver Israel out of Egypt? Was it because they were keeping the law? No, he delivered them out of his grace. The Torah is filled with grace. The problem is the, the terms that are normally used for grace, we translate as kindness or loving kindness. In the New Testament, you see the word grace. And so we think, the, we think what we call the Old Testament, the first covenant, the Torah, the Tanakh, is not filled with grace. It is filled with grace. Over and over again, you see God re redeeming his people out of his graciousness. He chose Israel because of his grace. He did all of these things for Israel freely of his own initiative because he loved them. It was an act of love. It was an act of grace. 
And so what, so when God says to Israel, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, this would trigger in their mind, everything, all of the gracious things that God has had done for them from the point of their deliverance up until now. It would bring all of his gracious deeds. It would bring about, it would, it would remind them of all of the wonderful things. And the purpose of this was to elicit, to elicit within the people gratitude. And the way they were to show this gratitude was by being loyal to God. Their, loyal, their, their loyalty, their faithfulness to God was an expression of gratitude. It was inspired by their gratitude. And does God call for their loyalty? Yes. Because in verse six, he says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And what does verse seven say? You shall have no other gods before me. That is the call to loyalty. Verse six elicits the gratitude. It inspires the gratitude. Verse seven calls forth the loyalty that the gratitude is to be uh, an, an expression of. Uh, the, the, so the loyalty, the faithfulness to God, which is encapsulated in the words, you're not to have any other gods before me, goes on to say, you should not make for yourselves in verse eight, a carved image of likeness of anything. You're not to serve anyone but me. Your loyalty is to me and to me alone, but it is to be inspired by gratitude. And again, this is how covenants were made. And this was the motivation for loyalty in ancient covenants, especially in what's known as the Hittite covenants that we see within the ancient Near East, they would do this. It was called the prologue. And you would give a historical pro prologue, 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 prologue. Uh, you, you begin, you would start with <laughs> and talk about, first of all, what did this great person do for you? That would elicit the gratitude, which would bring forth the loyalty. It was, it was, it was loyalty that was inspired and motivated by gratitude. So this is what God asked for them, complete and total loyalty. So God showed Israel, uh, God showed Israel grace by delivering them out of bondage to Egypt. Israel was to respond to God's grace. Because remember, when grace is shown, there's always a grace, a grace that is returned. And when grace is returned, it is an act of gratitude. So God delivers Israel. Israel shows their gratitude to God. How? By being loyal to him, by being faithful to him. This gratitude, and, and what is faithfulness within the context of Israel's covenant? Obedience to God's command. So at, Israel's gratitude was expressed and embodied in their faithful obedience to God's commandments. This obedience was motivated by, and it was an expression of gratitude. Their gratitude, so their gratitude inspired obedience was the basis and the means by which they prospered and flourished. Because remember what God said to Israel, if you keep my commandments, you will live. If you keep my commandments, you will be blessed. If you keep my commandments, you will flourish. But what's the basis of, what's the motivation for keeping the commandments? Gratitude. So God says, if you live a life of gratitude to me, it will cause your life to flourish. And how do I know you're living a life of gratitude? It's embodied in your obedience to me. Obedience should always, even for us today, Obedience is to flow out of gratitude out of what God has done for us. Gratitude should inspire. Gratitude should motivate our obedience to God. So this is why I say that gratitude is what brings about flourishing. This is one of the things, this is one of the uh, uh, ways of thinking and emotions that we want to cultivate because gratitude leads to flourishing. Gratitude was a, found, was a foundational stone upon which Israel's flourishing, upon which their success and prosperity was built. So flourishing, as we see in the life of Israel, flows from a life of gratitude. Flourishing flows from a life of gratitude. Now, why is this important to understand that this is one of the psychological aspects of our life that we want to cultivate? Why is it important to us to understand that gratitude uh, excuse me, that flourishing that pleases God, flourishing that pleases God flows from gratitude. Why is that important? Because a life of gratitude not only inspires and motivates obedience and faithfulness to God, it is also the antidote for, it's the antidote for, and it is a protection against covetousness. Let me say that again. Gratitude is important. 
gratitude, uh, a, for, a, a life of flourishing, a life of prosperity and success that pleases God flows from a life of gratitude. This is important to know because a life of gratitude not only inspires obedience to God, it not only inspires us to walk in his ways, which is what creates flourishing, but it is also an antidote for, and it is a protection against covetousness. Okay, turn to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Are you with me so far? For those of you in the Zoom room, for those of you on Facebook, am I making sense? Hebrews, let's go to Hebrews chapter 13. Why in the comment section, if I'm making sense, go, yeah, Mike, we're with you thus far. Hebrews chapter 13, and we're going to look at verse 5. Hebrews 13, verse 5 says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Let your conduct or your manner of life be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, so the writer of Hebrews was writing to the believers that he, his audience, and he says, I want your life to be free of covetousness. Okay. That applies to us too. Our conduct or our manner of life, our way of living is to be free of covetousness. Now, the word covetous here, covetousness here refers to a love of money, a love of money. In Greek, literally the way this is written in Greek is saying that we are not to have a love of money. We're not to, have, we're not to be covetous. We're not to have a love of money. Now, it's not saying don't make money. It's saying not to have a love of money. Why? Because of what covetousness or love of money leads to. What does covetousness lead to? Go to Micah chapter 2. Micah chapter 2. In the, what we call the Old Testament, I like to refer to it as the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. Micah chapter 2. Tanakh is a Jewish way actually referring to what we call the Old Testament. And it stands for the three divisions of scripture, the way that the Jewish people divide the scripture, the Torah, the T, the Nevi'im, which is the prophets, that's in, and then the Ketuvim are the writings, which is K, so the Tanakh. Jesus actually made reference to this in the book of Luke. He talked about, the Bible says he, he uh, made known to his disciples everything that was written, written about him in the law, the Torah, the uh, prophets, the Nevi'im, and the Psalms, which are considered part of the Ketuvim or the writings. So uh, Jesus recognized that threefold division. So I like to use the word Tanakh, in case you were wondering. All right, Micah chapter 2. That was a little bit extra. <laughs> Micah chapter two, we're going to look at verse one. What does covetousness lead to? Uh, Micah two, verse one. Woe to those who devise iniquity and work out evil on their beds. And morning light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. Verse two, they covet fields and take them by violence. Also houses and seize them. So they oppress a man in his house, a man and his inheritance. What does covetousness lead to? It leads to bad success. What's bad success? Bad success is when you are trying to increase, you seek to flourish, you seek to increase that which you have by oppressing others. You create internal and external conditions, as I said before, that brings about the suppression and the oppression of people and things. So you can increase, okay? Covetousness needs, leads to bad success. It leads to engaging in ways of thinking and acting that seeks to flourish at the expense of others. That's what covetous does. It will lead you to engage in ways of thinking, ways of acting that seeks to expand at the expense of other people. This is how you know. And what I mean at the expense of other people, you use people so you can have more, so you can be more. That's coveting. The 10th commandment really states this. What's the 10th commandment? The 10th commandment, both in Exodus 20, 17 and Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 21, talks about coveting. And it says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. This is from Exodus 20, 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Now, the word covet here, the Hebrew term is hamad. And it simply means to desire. It's actually used in certain places in a positive sense. Here it's used in a negative sense. Context determines how you should interpret the word. 
But the idea of coveting is not simply that you have a desire for something. It's the idea that I have a desire with, of what belongs to another and I go after it. I scheme, I plan, not how to get, uh, not how to get something like yours. It is how to get yours. That's coveting. Coveting is not about, oh, that's a nice house. That's a nice car. I like to have one like that. Let me go into my bank account and buy a car like that. No, coveting says, ooh, nice car. I'm going to take your car. Nice house. I'm going to take your house. Nice wife. Nice spouse. I'm going to take your spouse. That's coveting. It's a desire that leads to action. Covening is a desire that leads to action, action that is contrary to the will of God, action that will cause you to act in ways that will suppress or oppress another so you can expand at their expense. So I can get more land. I can get another spouse. I can get more servants. How? By taking yours. By taking yours. This is what we see here in Micah 2. What are they doing? They're laying on their bed. They're working out evil on their bed. They're imagining, they're planning. And at morning light, they practice it because it's in the power of their hands. It says in verse two, they covet fields and they take them by violence. See, they're coveting what belongs to someone else. And then on their beds, they're planning, they're imagining how to make it happen. And when they awake in the morning, they go out and they do it by violence. It says they covet fields and take them by violence. Also houses and they seize them, other people's houses. So they oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. It is always succeeding, prospering, flourishing at the expense of others. It is creating, notice, notice how I said it's internal and external conditions. What is this person doing? It says, woe to those who devise. The word devise there means imagine. They're devising, they're imagining, they're planning iniquity. They're planning to covet. They're planning to steal. They're planning to take through violence, through oppression. They create the internal environment and conditions, and then they go out and live it out. They create the external conditions to make it happen. That's why I say bad success, as well as good success, is something that you create within and without. All right? So coveting is greedily greedily desiring more, it's, it's, it's being greedy and, and greedily desiring to have more or to make more for oneself at the expense of others. It implies, covetousness implies stinginess and selfishness. It is only concerned with self and fulfilling one's own desires. This is, a, this is the psychology of bad success, okay? It is both what you're thinking and feeling. What's interesting, as many scholars have pointed out, the 10th commandment is the only commandment that prohibits desire. All of the other commandments prohibit actions and behaviors. This one prohibits desire, illicit desire, wrong desire. By the first century, this commandment, thou shalt not covet, and we've covered this in past session, was seen as the source of all sin. That if you break this commandment, it is what causes the breaking of all other commandments. So literally, thou shall not covet was thou shall not desire wrongly. Thou shall not, literally, thou shall not desire, but it's thou shall not desire that which is wrong. You should not desire in a wrong manner. You should not desire that which doesn't belong to you. You should not desire in an illegitimate way. Not saying don't desire, it's saying desiring in a wrong way, because if you do, it leads to all other type of sins. Okay? So, um, when you are coveting, you have a greedy desire for more, to have more, to make more for, your, for yourself at the expense of other people. It is very selfish and is about fulfilling one's own selfish desires. Jesus referenced this in Luke chapter 12 and verse 13 through 21. Let's go over there. Jesus talks about the parable of the rich fool. And he talks about it within the context or to give an illustration of coveting. And this would be an illustration of bad success. So Luke chapter 12, I'm going to start at verse 13 to give you some context. Then one from the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or an arbiter over, or an arbiter over you? And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain rich man 
yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I'll do this. I'll pull down my barns and build greater and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, when we, know, when we look at this parable, there are things we can notice. The rich man's abundance, notice this here, the rich man's abundance is from his own land. This is not an abundance from somebody else's land. This is an abundance from his land. Technically, technically, he's not stealing or taking from another person. Technically, he's not looking at someone else's land and someone else's abundance and taking it. This is his own abundance. So technically, he's not coveting what belongs to someone else, and yet he is. Because Jesus gives this as a way of showing what is coveting. He is coveting. You say, well, Mike, you say on the one hand, this is his land. How is he coveting? Keep in mind, this is Jesus is speaking this to a first century Jewish audience. Excuse me, a first century Greco-Roman audience. It would have been expected, and we've covered this in the past. It would have been expected within the ancient Mediterranean society that Jesus was speaking to and that he was speaking in, it would have been expected that he would share his God given abundance with others. It would, be, it would have been understood, this is why God gave you the abundance, so that you would share it with others, especially within a Jewish context. It was, if you've been given abundance and God has blessed you, and here we have no, we have no implication that he's done this in a, in a way that is illegitimate. His, yield, his fields yielded abundantly. Jesus is not against the abundance. Jesus is not against him having a lot. It is what he does with it. And what, is we, what was he supposed to do with it? If he has an abundance within a Jewish context, within a first century Mediterranean context, it was expected that someone like him who had been given a lot, he would share that abundance with others. But instead, he keeps it for himself. He stingily and greedily hoards and stores it away. Who is he taking from? Those who are in need. It would have been understood if you have an abundance, this abundance is for those in need. This guy is a rich man. He already has an abundance and God has blessed him so greatly that he has to tear down his barns because he has so much. And I, as one commentary said, rather than tearing down barns and storing it within barns, he could have stored it with other people. In other words, he could have given it away to share with those that were in need. He could have been a support to the community. This is what would have been expected. He could have been a patron or a benefactor to the community. He could have been upholding and helping people come up. He could have created a condition. He could have created an environment in which others could flourish, and he didn't do it. And that is what Jesus is criticizing the man about. He is not rich towards God. This is an idiom, meaning he's not sharing or giving to the poor. How do you become rich uh, towards God in a Jewish context? You give to the poor. So he's flourishing, but at the expense of others. This is not good success. This is bad success because he is flourishing by keeping more for himself, even though he's already been blessed, he has a lot, rather than taking what he has and creating an environment and creating conditions in which others can flourish, in which others can be free, he could be sharing the grain with others, he could be sharing the food with others, he could be sharing the seeds with others so that they could go and they could plant and they could be prosperous also, so they could come up, he takes it and keeps it all for himself. He is experiencing, he's walking in, he is pursuing bad success. He's creating, he has created an internal and an external environment that, and in conditions that brings about suppression and oppression for others. Rather than helping him, helping others, he is letting them to, he's leaving them to languish and he's contributing to the languishing. So he's not rich towards God. This is bad success. This is detrimental. And Jesus calls this 
coveting, coveting, having an abundance, but not using your abundance to create for others, to create environments, to create situations, to create jobs where other people can flourish. This is bad success. See, if you have an abundance, understand this is what I'm trying to get across to you. See, we're to pursue good success. So what are we to learn from this? We're to learn from this is that we, if we have an abundance, if we have a surplus, the question is to ask is, how can I use my surplus to create conditions, to create environments in which others can flourish? Because this is what good success does. Now, as I said before, gratitude, a life of gratitude, is an antidote and a protection against covetousness. It's an antidote and it's a, it's a protection against the greedy, selfish desire for more that's never satiated, that's never satisfied. See, when you are covetous, you will never be satisfied. You will never be satiated. It will never be enough. You will always be looking for more. So here's the thing. You say, how is gratitude an antidote and a protection? The Bible tells us in Psalms 139 and verse 14 that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. So now I'm going to start bringing in some psychology and some neuroscience, okay? We're fearfully and wonderfully made. The desire for more that we all have, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, so when it's not regulated properly, the desire for more is produced in us by a chemical and a molecule called dopamine. Now we've covered this in previous sessions. So we're recapping everything. There is within us a molecule called dopamine, a neurotransmitter called dopamine. Dopamine, if left to itself and not properly regulated, can create unsatiable desire. Now I'm talking science here, science. If dopamine is left to itself and it, if, it is, if it is not properly regulated, it can create unsatiable desire. Now, this happens from a theological perspective when our faculties, our being, is ruled by sin. Romans 6.12 says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. Okay? When sin rules in us, it creates lust and we want more. From a neuroscientific position, from a physiological position, this deals with dopamine being released. It's dopamine, if it's ruled by the lust of the flesh, dopamine gets released, or excuse me, if it's ruled by sin, dopamine becomes released and we have unsatiable desires. We have unsatiable longings, obsessive longings. And this is what the scientists from reading, remember this book, I talked about it before, The Molecule of More, they refer to dopamine that's unregulated as obsessive desire and longing, okay? So, uh, and this is from the book, The Molecules of More by Daniel Lieberman and Michael Long. So when, when dopamine is not regulated, we end up in a state of always wanting more. This is why they call do dopamine the molecule of more. And they say dopamine is amoral. Dopamine doesn't say, hey, I think I've had enough now. It, 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 and it doesn't see the difference between good more or, let, or bad more. It just wants more. That's why I say if it's unregulated, if it's ruled over by sin, it becomes a problem. And by the way, scientists know this. Let me read to you from The Molecule of More by Daniel, again, Daniel Z. Lieberman and Michael Long. This is from page 16 in the book. And this is what they said. Uh, let's see, where am I at here? They said... Um, to enjoy the things that we have, as opposed to things, no, I'm, I'm on the wrong page, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Where am I at? Hang on. <laughs> oh, okay, here I am. Uh, okay, so page 16, actually, paragraph one. Okay. Um, from dopamine's point of view, having things is uninteresting. Now, notice that for a second, because people seek more things, but really, as they say here, from dopamine's point of view, having things, more things, is uninteresting. It, it is only getting things that matter. Sometimes people have referred to dopamine as the pleasure molecule. But actually what scientists, neuroscientists are telling us now is that dopamine is not really not the pleasure molecule as much as it is, as it is the anticipation molecule. That it anticipates getting more. The pleasure of dopamine is not in getting the more, it's in 
anticipating getting more. So this is why they say from dopamine's point of view, having things, possessing things is uninteresting. It is only getting things that matter. If you live under a bridge, dopamine makes you want a tent. If you live in a tent, dopamine makes you want a house. If you live in the most expensive mansion in the world, dopamine makes you want a cap makes you want a castle on the moon. Dopamine has no standard for good and seeks no finish line. The dopamine circuits in the brain can be stimulated only by the possibility of whatever is shiny and new. Never mind how perfect things are in the moment. The dopamine model is more. Okay? Do you hear that? See, dopamine just wants more. Okay? So, what's the key? Now, this is the way we are designed. And dopamine has a good part to it. The rabbis of Israel would call it um they they would refer to the they would they would um talk about and reference what is known as yetzahara, the evil inclination. The evil inclination. It's very fascinating when you study this. Because the rabbis of Israel of Israel believes you had two inclinations. There was a good inclination and there was an evil inclination. The good inclination is called Yetzer Hatov, good inclination or good impulse. The evil inclination is called Yetzer Hara, the evil impulse, the evil inclination. It could even be called the evil imagination. All right. The rabbis of Israel recognized, they said, is the evil, they, they, there's a quote, and I meant to bring it, I forgot. I may bring it next week. They say, is the evil inclination totally evil? Even though it's, we call it the evil inclination, but is it totally evil? And they go, no. They said, because without the evil inclination, we would not build houses. Without the in evil inclination, we would not marry and procreate. Without the evil inclination, we would not start a business and promote commerce. So hear me what I'm saying. They understood there is an impulse within us that drives us to create more. They said it's evil when it is misused. It is evil when it is not ruled over. Remember it says here, let me say this. Let me read this. They said, um, dopamine has no standard for good and seeks no finish lines. Now the rabbis of Israel, the sages of Israel recognize the evil inclination, that desire, that impulse to create more, if left to itself, will become evil. So they said, in, in their thinking and in their, uh, in their um, and their structure of thinking about this, they said it, it, the evil inclination has to be ruled over by the Torah. You have to establish standards of right and wrong because they understood if not, this evil inclination, this desire, this impulse will get out of bounds and it will create things that are detrimental. Now you can begin to see covetousness, the desire for more. This is why we will go past the bounds and say, I want more. I'll take what belongs to my neighbor. So. According to neuroscience, dopamine always wants more. Not necessarily that more is bad, it becomes a problem when it is not regulated properly. So what counters dopamine? What counters this, this yearning for more and always wanting more? Because it said it has no limits, it has no stops. What counters it? What counters it is something that God also created within us, known as the here and now molecules. This is what they call it. The here and now molecules or the H&M, the here and now molecules. These are uh, uh, neurotransmitters like serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphins. These are called the here and now molecules, okay? Let me read to you again from the molecule of more about the here and now molecules. They said to enjoy the things we have. Let me, let me back up for a second. Remember, it said that dopamine, when it's operating, when it's high and it's not being regulated properly, it will always want more, no matter, no, never mind how perfect things are in the moment. So even though you, in, in other words, you, you, you want something, you get it, dopamine, once you get it, you're satisfied with it only for a moment, then you want more. So no matter how perfect things are in the moment, you're never content. You're always wanting more if dopamine is not regulated. Okay, so what counters this? God also created us with something that counters this. It says, let me read this. It says, dopamine isn't the pleasure molecule. After all, it's the anticipation molecule. This is what I said before. 
So this is the point I want you to hear. To enjoy the things we have, to enjoy the things we have, as opposed to the things that are only possible, our brains must transition from future-oriented dopamine to present-oriented chemicals, a collection of neurotransmitters we call the here and now molecules or the H and Ns. And it says these include serotonin, oxytocin, endorphins, and a class of other chemicals. Okay, so in order to counter dopamine, and we need both, you need dopamine because dop dopamine is what uh, triggers creativity. Dopamine is what en enables you to envision more possibilities. But notice, as we've seen in the scriptures, this can be used for good or this can be used for bad. The guy who was coveting other people's fields, his dopamine was in overdrive and he began to imagine, how can I take it from my neighbor? That's a bad success. But in good success, dopamine will seek to create more that benefits not only you, but others, okay? But you still need a balance of it. This is why we have the H and N molecules. See, um, the H and N molecules, when they are released, you know what they do? They suppress the dopamine molecule. So let's say this is dopamine. When you experience and release the here and now molecules, serotonin, uh, oxytocin, endorphins, and others, it when when these H and N molecules go on the rise, the serotonin, serotonin, I'm excuse me, the dopamine gets suppressed. Okay. So dopamine, again, is the molecule that wants more. It gets suppressed. So when the H and N molecules are released, they suppress the dopamine molecule that wants more and more, which means covetousness goes down. Covetousness gets um, suppressed. Somebody asked me the question, what do you think God's original intent is for dopamine? Dopamine provides motivation. Dopamine uh, inspires creativity. Everything we have around us is because people wanted, people were able to see and they wanted more than what currently is. That's not a bad thing. Without dopamine, you wouldn't have the iPhone. You wouldn't have the computer that you're watching me on. I wouldn't have the iPad that I'm currently using to read my notes from. Dopamine helps with creativity. Dopamine creates more. The problem is if it gets out of bounds, if it's not controlled, it becomes destructive. It's like fire. Fire warms. Fire can cook. Fire can be wonderful. When we were staying, uh, when we, uh, my family went on a vacation, my daughter and, and my daughters and my wife went to Newport Beach, they had a fireplace and, and they would turn, the, they had fireplaces in different parts of the room to warm up the house. They would turn it on. It would warm up the house. It was beautiful. But could you imagine if that fire went outside the bonds of the fireplace? Now it becomes destructive. When there is no limitation, when there is no structure, when there is no guidance of the fire, now that which is for your benefit becomes destructive. Think of dopamine like the fire. You can utilize the fire to build, you can, I mean, to cook. You can utilize the fire to warm. You can utilize the fire to have a good time. But if it gets outside the boundaries that are set, it becomes something that is destructive. Dopamine can create more. But when dopamine gets outside the boundaries that are laid out by God, it becomes something that is destructive. Very good question. I hope the person, Carla, you who asked me the question, does that, does that help? And if it does, Carla, just let me know. Okay, this is in our Zoom room, our, our, our Oasis people. They wanted to know that. So, I, and I'm, that's a great question. I'm glad she asked that. So dopamine is good. Everything God created about you is good. Genesis chapter one, when God created, he looked upon everything he made and behold, it was good. That means everything about you is good. However, if it's ruled over by sin, it then sin takes it beyond God's intended purpose and means, and then it becomes something that is destructive. So one of the ways God has created a boundary is to create within us the H and N neurotransmitters. When the H and N neurotransmitters go up, when they are released, the dopamine transmitter goes down. It gets suppressed, which also means if there is covetousness, it gets suppressed by the release of the here and now neurotransmitters. So when dopamine is suppressed by the H and N neurotransmitters or circuits, what's the result? When you have an increase of H and N neurotransmitters, what do you experience? Do you experience a desire for more? Do you experience a desire for, um, uh, do you have a greeting longing for more? Nope, you know what you experience? You experience satisfaction and contentment, contentedness. When you experience H and N molecules, or, or neurotransmitters, you are happy with what you have. 
That's the balance. See, God made us so that we could function within balance in a healthy way. So um, let me read to you again what it says about from the molecules of more. It says, um, actually, let me read to you about the H and N circuits. This again is from the molecules of more, page seventeen, paragraph two. It says, in fact, uh, no, that's not what I want to read. Uh, where's it at? No, this may. Have... Oh, okay. I see. Okay. Um, it says when H and N circuits are activated, when the here and now neurotransmitters are released, when the circuits are activated, we are prompted to experience the real world around us and dopamine is suppressed. When dopamine circuits are activated, we move into a future of possibilities and the here and now neurotransmitters are suppressed. So dopamine helps you to see future possibilities that's needed to create, that's needed to create more, to create useful things, okay? But it can be used for evil if it's not properly regulated. But what, when H and N circuits are activated, we experience the world around us. We, we, in other words, we're not thinking about the future and what, what we can have and more. We, we come to the present moment and we enjoy what we have in the present moment. As a matter of fact, this is what they say from the molecule of more. They said H and N, the here and now molecules or neurotransmitters give us the ability to find satisfaction in what is right in front of us without the nagging sense that we need something more. That's from page 18 and 19 of the molecule of more. H and N, so serotonin, endorphins, oxytocin, they give us the ability to find satisfaction with what is right in front of us. In other words, what you currently have right now. It brings you into the present moment. And not only does it bring you into the present moment, it enables you to enjoy what you have right here and right now. And you don't have that nagging sense that you got to have more, that this is not enough. I'm not satisfied. I'm not content. When you are not content, it's because your dopamine levels are high and you're looking for the next thing. You're looking for the next thing. Well, what is it that promotes the release of the H&N molecules? What is it that promotes the release of the H&N neurotransmitters that brings you to a sense of contentedness and satisfaction. What will release it on purpose? Gratitude. Gratitude releases H and N molecules. According to Dr. David Destano in his book, Emotional Success, that's this book right here, Emotional Success, Dr. David Destano in his book, Emotional Success, he quotes research by two psychologists, Jeffrey Fro from UC Berkeley and Thomas Gilovich from Cornell University, their research shows that people who experience gratitude more frequently tend to be less materialistic. They say that gratitude decreases materialism. Gratitude causes us to be less materialistic, less covetous, and we become more satisfied with what we have already. There's a Jewish work known as Peter K. Volk that says this, who is he that is rich? It asks the question, who is the one that is rich? What's the answer? He who rejoice, rejoices in his portion, or he who rejoices in what he already has. Who is the rich person? The person who rejoices in what they already have. The person who is rejoicing, the person who was thankful, the person who was grateful, what they have is a psychological fulfillment and, in, and a contentment. A psycholo they, are, they are psychologically full. They are psychologically content. They're free from obsessive longing. They are free from covetousness. They are free from materialism. They are free from pursuing bad success. They will pursue good success. Now you say, well, Mike, if they are content, will that, won't that cause them to become satisfied to the point of, you know, just, they don't want to do anything. They become mediocre. They become, um, they lose their drive, their ambition. No, here's the thing that's interesting. Once your H and N molecules go up, they get released. It causes a suppression or a deficiency of dopamine. This gives your dopamine time to renew and restore itself. And because you have a deficit, a dopamine deficiency, it begins to renew itself. It begins to replenish itself, and it begins to go back on the rise again. This is what fuels motivation. This again is what fuels creativity. So what you need is a balance 
of the two. We're going to be talking about this in the future, but one of the keys to pursuing good success is to do what God said, and that's to practice the Sabbath, to take a time off when you cease production, when you cease making more. But when you do that, it gives your dopamine time to renew and, re and refresh itself so that when you go back into the world of production, you have the motivation to do so again. One of the reasons people burn out is because they keep going, they keep going, they keep going. They can burn out their dopamine to where it's, it's not functioning as it should, and they lose their drive. They have no motivation. So rest is important. To pull away from production is important. There is a time when we must stop uh, and we, we, there was a time when we stopped seeking to produce, to create more. God worked this into creation. He worked this into uh, the Ten Commandments. It, it's part of his commandments. So what's my point here, what I'm saying? You don't become less ambitious because you are content. It works on a healthy cycle. There are times when you are pursuing, you're seeking to create more, and you have in place the moral and ethical structures. This is why we renew our minds to understand that, uh, that as a person who pursues good success, it's not just about me, that if I have and I create more, I'm creating the internal and the external conditions and environments so that I not only prosper, but I cause others around me to prosper. I enable them to do more. I enable them to do better. But then there are times I pull back and I am thankful on purpose. Gratitude must be on purpose. We are told, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. When I purposely stop and I thank God for what he's done, when I purposely stop and I thank God for the blessings that he's brought into my life, whether it's material things or people, whether it's my wife or my children, and I appreciate and I truly feel and practice appreciation it creates contentedness. It creates satisfaction. When it's doing that, it's allowing my dopamine to, re to repair and replenish and renew so that when I go back out again, ruled over by the moral and ethical standards of God, ruled over by the spirit of God, then I'm going to be utilizing that, that, uh, that, that dopamine inspiration and creativity in a way that pleases God. Does that make sense? If I'm walking in the flesh and I'm only thinking about myself and I'm only seeing my abundance as being for me, it will never be enough. I'll get an abundance because see, dopamine is not satisfied and it's not interested in what you have. It's how much more can we create? Dopamine is always on creating more, creating more, creating more. Okay, we got that, great, it's done. What else can we do? What else can we acquire? What else can we, and if you don't have the right moral and ethical structures in place, in other words, the truth of God and the spirit of God, what can end up happening is that that dopamine inspiration, that dopamine motivation gets out of bounds and it becomes like a fire that is not contained and now it becomes destructive. Okay, let's close with this. Um, so again, let me say this again, the person who rejoices, the person who's thankful for what they have is psychologically full and content. They are free from obsessive longing. We know psychologically that, that um, Thanksgiving gratitude produces a sense of contentment. But now we also knew, know neuroscientifically why it does that. Because when you are in gratitude, you begin to release the H&N neurochemicals, the here and now chemicals. You're not thinking about what you can achieve in the future. You stay in the present here and now. You're thankful you enjoy what you have okay that's what the h and chemicals it's the way god designed you we're fearfully and wonderfully made okay last verse of scripture go to deuteronomy chapter 28 just want to show you one more thing deuteronomy chapter 28 and then we were close i hope you are enjoying this i hope you got a lot out of this uh deuteronomy chapter 28 is going to say getting ready to say something about that ah, i'll wait till i'm done deuteronomy 28 first 45 deuteronomy 28 verse 45 god says to israel and he's talking to them about what will happen if they disobey the commandments. The curses will come upon them. Verse 45 of Deuteronomy 28. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon you and pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which he commanded you. 
and they shall be upon you for a sign and a wonder and on your descendants forever. Verse 47, because you did not serve the Lord your God. Now notice this. Why are these things coming upon you? Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord your God will send against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness and in need of everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. Now notice this. God said, the reason you, these curses will come upon you is because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart. Israel is experiencing the curses because they were disobedience, disobedient to God's commandments, God's ways, his way of life. What caused them to be disobedient to God's way of life? God says, because you did not serve me with joy and gladness for the abundance of things that I gave to you. In other words, the reason they were no longer serving him was, be, was because of a lack of gratitude. They, were, they, they had moved from gratitude to ingratitude. It was, it, they were serving him because of, it was a lack of serving him out of gratitude or ingratitude that caused them to now break his commandments. Remember we said before, the basis of Israel's obedience, the basis of their obedience was God's graciousness to them. As God was gracious to them, it would elicit in them also a sense of gratitude. And that is what would motivate their obedience. Obedience was to be motivated by gratitude. God is saying here in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17, because you did not serve me out of joy and gladness of heart for all of the abundance of things that I gave you, therefore these curses will come upon you. Meaning what? You stop serving me out of gratitude. You stop keeping my commandments. So as a result, you became discontent. No, if there's no gratitude, there's no contentment. You became discontent, which means what? Dopamine level, the, the, the H&N molecules go down. The dopamine levels go up. They're throwing off God's ways. They're throwing off God's moral and ethical structures for them. And now what happens? They break his commandments. Well, what's the, one of the commandments they're going to be breaking? Thou shalt not covet. They're breaking that commandment. And again, in the first century, this commandment was seen as the source of all sin. They were now coveting. They were now experiencing a desire and a longing for more that was contrary to God's will. So they began to even break out of the boundaries. They began to break out out of the guidelines that God had given to them in order to have more because now their desires, what the rabbis would later call Yetzahara, the evil inclination, it was no longer being channeled and controlled by God's word. It was now being controlled by sin. And it was breaking out and it was causing them to engage in actions and behaviors that were contrary to God's will so they could get more at the expense of other people. And God says, this will bring you, this pursuit of bad success will bring you into a place of having need. It will bring you into a place where you're no longer flourishing. If you seek a bad flourishing, the end result of it is you actually will not flourish. This is why it's important that you and I on purpose practice and we live a life of gratitude. That every so often we stop and we say, God, thank you. Thank you. When I see people who tell me that they are discontent, that they are unhappy, and whether it's in their personal life, in their professional life, whether it's in their marriages, whether it's in their careers, and the people who even have a lot and they just go like, and, and, and they're like, I'm not happy with what I have, or I'm bored, or I'm not, that says to me that someone is not taking the time to really, really be thankful and, and express gratitude. This is something you have to do on purpose. Remember what God said, and this is where we close. I said before you, life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life so that you might live, that you and your descendants might live. Notice, you and your descendants might live. When you choose life, when you choose the way of life that God says leads to flourishing that pleases him, it creates a situation where not only you flourish, 
but other flourish, other people flourish as well. Okay, but we have to do it on purpose. God says, choose life. You must choose life to live. So you and I, if we're going to pursue good success, one of the things we must do, we must choose part of living a life of good success is choosing to live a life of gratitude, live a life of thanksgiving. Not, every, not, not, not you know, once in a while, but it becomes a part of our regular daily living that we live a life of gratitude. Do you know, and I'm, and I'm just going to close here, but did you know that expressing thanks to your spouse if you're married can help you to appreciate your spouse more? But have a, a true heartfelt thank you. You know, Karen and I, we say thank you all the time for some of the smallest things. You know, thank you. Like the other day, I was going to get my hair cut yesterday. Karen was going to get her hair done and I was going to get my hair done. Okay, get a haircut. Um, she was in a meeting and I called my barber and said, hey, you got a, sp a spot open for me to get my haircut? He said, I got one now. And it was like about 10 minutes to one. I said, cool, can I come? He said, yeah, come on down. So I said, great. And I was going to go tell Karen. Normally I tell her, hey, I'm going to go get a haircut. She was in a meeting. So I thought, okay, can't tell her right now. So I told my daughters, hey, if you see your mom, tell her I went to go get a haircut. Jump in the car. I'm driving. And I get a message from Karen. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm finishing up. I'm supposed to get my hair done at two. Now I knew she was going to get her hair done at two, but I didn't know when she needed to leave. I thought, well, maybe I can get there back. Long story short, I was like, oh, I'm going to have to come back because I'm not going to have enough time. So I drive around. I come back. She calls me, have my earpiece in. I go, yeah, what's up? She says, hey, um, were you coming back to get me? I go, yeah. She said, you know, you don't have to. I'm going to borrow Liv's car, our oldest daughter, Olivia, and I'm just going to drive up there. I said, I can come get you. She says, no, no, no. I'm just going to drive it because I got a meeting at two o'clock anyway. I'm just going to do the meeting in the car when I get there. And um, that way you don't have to come back to get me. So I said, okay, cool. I turn around, driving back, called my barber to let him know I was on the way for sure. And I thought about it. And I went, man, that was really nice of her. So I just called her back. I said, dear, thank you for doing that. Thank you for doing it. Now, I was willing to, you know, go pick her up. I drop her off, then I go get a haircut, and then I just, you know, pick her up later. But she said, no, no, no. She said, no problem. I said, but thank you for doing that. And see, and, and she does that. There are times I'll do things for her, like go get her some coffee. And she goes, thank you for going to get me some coffee. It's just a little thing. Saying thank you for little things. It helps to create a bond, helps to create esteem for the other person helps to create appreciation for the other person. That helps to create more love. It helps to create where you are satisfied in a good way with the relationship so that I don't have to go outside of the relationship being motivated by dopamine because I need something more. You get what I'm saying? Gratitude, practice it as a way of life. People who pursue and live good success, the success that pleases God are people who live lives of gratitude, which leads to contentedness. And that pleases God. All right. Hope this was something that you enjoyed. I hope it was not only enjoy, but that you got a lot out of it. And I know we had to take a long way around to get to this, but I hope that this is something you can learn from and that you will practice. God wants us to pursue good success. Part of pursuing good success is living a life of gratitude. Next week, we're going to talk more about the psychology of good and bad success. But if you found this to be helpful, please share it with someone. I'll be uploading it to our uh, YouTube channel, CCTV TV, which the name will be changing very soon. <laughs> haven't changed it yet. But if you could go there and watch all the videos of things we talked about thus far, Lord willing, we will see you here next week. So again, if you found this to be a blessing for you, let me know and let somebody else know so they can watch it also. All right, everybody. Thank you so very much. For those of you in the Zoom room, Thank you so much for being here and meeting with us. And we'll see you all, Lord willing, next week. Bye, everybody.